In this video, I'm just going to pay a little bit more attention to a couple of the big tech giants, specifically Facebook and Google. But before we do that, and we start to cast our moral guise, gaze upon them, let's remind ourselves about what they can claim that their mission statements are. What are they there to do? Um, well, Facebook claimed that it's to give people the power to build community and bring the world closer together. And Google, on the other hand, is to organize the world's information, make it universally accessible and useful, both of which I would argue are very noble aims. And I guess, you know, cases can be made to, uh, to um, support both Facebook and Google's view of themselves. And certainly in the case of Google, that their vision, mission statement is very much at the core of what they do. But in doing what they do, they sometimes fall foul of others. As an example, when Google set up Street View or even Google Maps, particularly from Satellite View, did they ask for anybody's permission? No. Furthermore, when Google decided that they were going to share the world's literature by putting books online is a noble um, aspiration, but they didn't ask any of the authors whether or not that was acceptable. And neither did they uh, come to any arrangement with the authors about copyright fees. There's a kind of arrogance there, isn't there, that suggests that because it's Google and we're doing it for the right reasons, therefore it is right. But of course, you can't do such or take such actions without looking at the wider implications. Now, big tech has created some strange business models. We've talked about platforms and, and platformization in earlier materials. But let's have a look at capitalism as it applies to big tech. Capitalism, business and economics, assumes that there are two parts. There are the producers of goods and services and there are the consumers of goods and services. Capitalism or critiques of capitalism might well look at the potential exploitation of both parties. In that, Marx draws attention to the potential exploitation of workers for capitalist gain. Consumption, um, th th uh, theorists of consume, consumption and consumers look at also a capitalist exploitation of the consumer through marketing. Um, and I'm referring to the um, early observations of a group of post-Marxist uh, post theorists that started off in Frankfurt and ended up in the US um, as a consequence of um, the Second World War and the policies of, of Hitler. When they arrived in the US, the theorists were shocked, I think it's fair to say, about the reach and the power that media had and the, the pervasiveness of marketing. In those particular, uh, in that country, to the extent that they would class the mark, uh, cl sorry, to the extent that they would class marketing as being propagandist. It's not marketing; it's propaganda, or just a different form of propaganda. You have to remember that they'd come from Germany, where they'd seen political propaganda, and they drew parallels with the consuming, consumption, or or, or, or um, consumer marketing, they drew parallels with the German equivalents or the German political propaganda with consumer marketing and equated it to consumer propaganda, which um, results in the exploitation of the consumer, as in you're being convinced to buy stuff that you neither need nor really want. Um, the idea being within big tech or within social media in particular is that we can resolve the problems of exploitation of workers as a consequence of production and the exploitation of consumers 
as a consequence of propagandist marking by putting the consumer to work. So they become both. And a term, it's another portmanteau word has been originated, referring to prosumption. In that when you consume social media or you use social media or big tech, you are both the producer and consumer of content. You do both. Now, it's not unusual, this idea about prosumption, is that actually prosumption appears in everyday economy quite frequently. Things like scanning your own groceries when you go to the superstores um, or wheeling your bins out so that the rubbish can be collected. But the digital frameworks has created the presumptive or the presumption economy to a huge unparalleled extent in that you, by engaging in social media, create content such as a YouTube video, which others will enjoy, which costs Google nothing, of course. But furthermore than that is that by searching the internet through Google's interface or in its algorithm, or by any interactions with the internet is that you create a data flow. And the data flow can also be used. And it's, it, it's cost the, the, the platform nothing to um, originate it. So you've got this weird sort of idea of prosumption you're, pros, you're a prosumer. You are both the producer and the consumer of content. And then there are also third parties that will consume your content without you knowing. And I've got a quote there from Zwick, which says, the recruitment of consumers into productive co-creation relationships hinges on accommodating consumers' needs for recognition, recognition, freedom, and agency. And the point that Zwick is making here is that although we are engaging in a, an arrangement with big tech, actually we don't mind. We quite like it because that's the cost that we have to pay in order to enjoy those facilities in the first place. However, let's look at that a bit more deeply. Because your every keystroke on a computer or a phone is logged, is that in effect you're being a co-conspirator or a, no, that's a bit strong. In effect, you are being a, um, a collaborator in surveillance. You are effectively being surveilled. Now there are deeper elements to this, and this has come out as a consequence of COVID. Because people have to work from home, or have been required to work from home, um, is that firms have been very concerned, certain firms anyway, have been rather concerned about whether or not their workforce is engaging in work as a con uh, or they're meeting the requirements of their contract. So some firms have actually set up systems within their own systems whereby you indicate that you are work by logging on to the company's databases, internet, so on and so forth. So it, so in, in effect, is that the surveillances that took place in the workplace, because we could see you, has been replicated in the home. The firm has moved into your home, which is interesting. Now, there is a requirement perhaps for surveillance, for surveillance technologies. Um, is it as a way of tracking terrorist groups? as an example. And rises in surveillance are very often greeted with comments along that, well, what's the problem? If you're not doing anything wrong, what's the problem? Well, the problem is you don't know what is being kept of you, 
of your imprint, you, you may well be completely innocent going about your own business. But that, does that give the right for somebody to wholesale, or somebody or some institution to wholesale, surveil and record and have the capacity to be able to listen in on your everyday life? That seems to be at the opposite end of considerations of capitalism and freedom, which was the book by Hayek. If you know your economic theory is that Hayek wrote the book Capitalism and Freedom, where it was, it was the, the idea being is that capitalism gave people freedom because you had choice. Well, is that freedom taken away if what you're doing is that you're being surveilled? Through every keystroke, every interaction, your phone provides you with a GPS um, technology, which is very handy to know where you want, where you are. But also it lets everybody else know where you are as well. So does surveillances and big tech take away privacy or does it invade your privacy? Privacy, And is that an acceptable cost to be paid to the prosumer? Because make no bones about it is that the firms, the platforms make considerable amounts of money out of your prosumption and mine our prosumption. And what's quite interesting is that the big tech giants know that they're surveilling and you are being surveilled. Because what's interesting here is that this is a picture of Zuckerberg holding something up, but about a tweet that he's made or something along those lines. And that's not the point. What is the point is that is that if you look at the exploded picture on the left hand side is that what you've got is that in the two red rings is that you can see that Zuckerberg is aware of the fact that you can be monitored even though you don't want to be monitored is that there is tape over the camera on his laptop and that the ports on the side of the computer have been disabled so that thumb, net, thumb drives can't be put into the computer and even if somebody does hack this particular computer <laughs> or somebody turns on the um, turns on the camera from against his own volition is that they won't be able to see what's going on. Now, you could argue, so well, that's very sensible because, you know, Zuckerberg might be have private conversations and be commercially sensitive and so on and so forth. But that's not the point, is it? The point is that this can happen to each and every one of you, one of us, is that there was a court case not that long back where Apple admitted that Siri listens all the time, even if you've turned it off, is that Apple have got the capacity, if you are in earshot of your phone, of being able to listen to your conversations via Siri. Now you'd have to enable Siri on your phone first, but you can make it less accurate. You can, you, you can, if you've enabled it, is that you can't turn it off, basically. It's either off or it's on. But Apple were controlling what they were listening to. Now, were they listening to anything? Were they doing anything disingenuous? They, they could argue that, well, we're only doing it in order to be able to make our products better. And that's the same argument that Google would use. The only reason that they collect all of the information about the way that you search is to make their algorithm, their search engine, more effective and more efficient. Well, okay, but at what cost? And at what cost to who? To who? There's an argument to suggest that if they want to use your data, they should pay you for it. Being have from free access to Google's products, is that sufficient? After all, Google is a staggeringly successful business. Where's my share in that business? After all, I'm providing you with the content that you're using and I'm providing you with data that you're using. Where's my share? This has led some commentators such as Zuboff 
which is an interesting book. I don't recommend that you buy it because it's written in a particular style, which is hard work, to be perfectly honest. It's, it's written as a, a rather hyperbolic purple novel, um, and it's not very objective. And as a consequence, that is twice as long as it needs to be. <clears throat> but Zuboff, broadly speaking, outlines what I've just said, is that firms, big tech firms, make staggering amounts of money out of surveilling you. A surveillance that we're all complicit in because we use them. We know that we're being surveilled, but we use them anyway. And she's called it surveillance capitalism. And I, and I think that she, she, in her book, she gives a really interesting example, which is about Pokemon Go. Now, who created Pokemon Go? Well, it wasn't Nintendo. It was a branch of Google. Um, the, Google's created the Alphabet brand or the Alphabet company so that there were a lot of subsidiary companies that could exist underneath it, which weren't affiliated directly to some of their bigger brands. They're a bit like special interest vehicles in some ways. But nevertheless, Google created one that bought the licenses for Pokemon and created Pokemon Go which was a phenomenon, was it not? Less so now, although I did see a video on um, Google that said that somebody out in Asia somewhere had captured 730-odd Pokemon in one go, which boggles my mind, really, because you just think, did you not eat or sleep? Or Anyway, that's by the point. But the, 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 the story, as recounted by Zuboff, is, is about the development of Pokemon Go. And... On the one side is that you might say, well, Pokemon Go is just a bit of fun, isn't it? We all like the characters, just go out and you find the characters and you collect them and you can compete with your mates and it's fun. But there is a deeper narrative to be understood here in that Google's um, revenues are driven by advertising and Google gets paid more money if you click on an advert. Google gets paid much more money if you click on an advert and you buy something. Similarly, if you watch a YouTube video and somebody directs you towards their Amazon page is that yes, you will be benefiting the YouTuber, but you'll also be paying a small amount of money to Google as well. So Google makes more money if its adverts are effective at pushing people through the requisite channels to make purchases. Now, Google has worked out through its adware software that actually it can predict to a greater or lesser extent, people's, people's willingness to spend. And in essence, that's why they're collecting huge amounts of data on you, is to send you adverts that match your likes, your def definite likes, so that you'll click on them. And it's very sophisticated. Pokemon Go is an attempt to make that more sophisticated. It was an attempt to actually increase the predictive capacity of the consumer or the prosumer. Now, this isn't the only area that Google are working on in order to try and predict human behavior. For years, Google has been banned from China. Um, but Google is actually working very, very closely with the Chinese state on smart cities, um, interactive or internet connected cities, smart cities. And the point of that is that, that Google collects, are collecting big data sets, which help predict people's behavior. Now, again, you can say, well, there's nothing wrong with that. It just helps traffic flow, makes the cities work efficiently and so on and so forth. But which particular point does prediction start to become control? Because they're very closely correlated, aren't they? Pokemon Go was an attempt to 
determine people's behaviors by saying that and more latterly the, the game had developed so that a particularly rare pokemon might appear next to a mcdonald's and in the mcdonald's windows there would be um, offers for pokemon related pokemon related offers or just a general offers for sales so there's quite an interesting linkage between predictions of behavior control of behavior advertisement stroke propaganda consumers and prosumption google's non-stated goal but a goal that is reiterated both by zuboff and faraha is that Google is operating or is attempting to refine its algorithms to the point where it removes risk and uncertainty. In other words, it can predict people's behavior. So we've looked at Google, let's look at Facebook. And Facebook's relations with the users, with the, prosum the prosumers, Facebook's likes are an accurate predictor of sensitive personal attributes. Facebook can accurately predict your sexuality, as an example. Facebook is designed to be addictive by sending out little dopamine hits. Scott Parker, who was one of the original founders, says the thought process was all about how do we consume as much of your time and conscious attention as possible. And that means that we need to sort of give you a little dopamine hit every once in a while because someone liked or commented on a photo or a post or whatever. And that's going to get you to contribute more content. And that's going to get you more likes and more comments. It's a social validation feedback loop. You're exploiting a vulnerability in the human psychology. Now, again, is if you believe that you're impervious to this, think again. Uh, Jared Leto, who has thought quite deeply, is an interesting chap, an interesting commentator on this, acknowledges particularly that younger minds are not impervious to this. And to an extent, we all are affected by the addictive nature and the propagandist nature, the directional, the, the direction of the information, the, the, the thought processes that go behind it, we're all impacted to a certain extent by the flows of data that you experience in social media and platforms more generally. Facebook have created uh, dopamine labs in order to build specifically addictive apps. And we can raise moral objections to this. Is it wrong to build products through a program called Skinner that are addictive? There's a, another app called Space that actually helps you manage your time online. So you create an app or you download an app owned by Facebook that helps you manage your time online, providing more data, providing more sense about what you like and what you don't like. If it was alcohol, tobacco, gambling, or shopping in general that was deliberately setting out to be addictive, there'd be uproar. But social media, there doesn't seem to be. Moral and ethical questions can be raised, therefore. So there's a list of data, or a list of things, really, about you that Facebook knows, if you're a user, or if you're a prosumer. Read it. It's extensive, isn't it? Doesn't stop there.
and actually it doesn't stop there either there's more what gives the big tech companies the right to know more about you than you know <laughs>